So we'll briefly go over a couple of topics from modern physics. first one here was covered in general physics, and it's the bound state problem, the particle in a box problem, where you have a particle such as an electron confined in a space. And we'll just deal with one dimension here from x equals 0 to x equals a. The graph shows the potential energy levels of those electrons, the energy levels of those electrons, and the shapes of the curves are the shapes of the wave functions. There are solutions to the Schrodinger equation. So the Schrodinger equation, when solved with these boundary conditions, x from 0 to a, with the potential of 0 in that range and infinity everywhere else, gives a solution of a sinusoid. So that's uh, the solution that's worked out when, when that problem is done. I'm not going to do it here. I'm just going to give it as the, as the solution of this is what the wave function of an electron that is confined between 0 and a looks like where you can have uh, indices n equals 1, 2, 3, dot, dot, dot. So there are modes that go all the way up to n equals infinity, <laughs> describing states that the electron can occupy. And each one of those states has a successively higher energy level, E sub n. It goes as the square of the index, so they get really far apart from each other quite quickly as n increases. H is the Planck constant. Let's uh, use that. Uh, we'll use that right now. Let's just do a problem that uses this uh, the solution to the Schrodinger equation for an electron that is trapped in a region from 0 to A. We'll imagine a silicon layer that's sandwiched between two insulating silicon dioxide layers. The silicon layer is 5 nanometers thick. Silicon dioxide layers are insulating. The silicon layer is semiconducting. An electron can move around inside the silicon. What we want to calculate are the allowed energies that that electron can have. And they're described by the particle in a box. So in other words, this is a confined state. And, and it's a real thing. It, it, it really happens where you have a conductor, but such as a layer of silicon, sandwiched between two insulating layers. You get what's called a two-dimensional electron gas. Given an effective mass for the electron at 0.26, let's just go ahead and get the energies from the particle in a box model. The m star is not just 0.26, it's 0.26 times the electron mass. We'll uh, use uh, h as Planck's constant, which you can pull out of the front cover of your textbook. And so for m star, I'm going 0.26 times 9.11 times 7 minus 31 kilograms. A was given as 5 nanometers. We have to do this in SI units, so we have to put the length A in, in meters. It's just like Planck's constant is in joule seconds. And when you get done, you can convert that to electron volts. But for now, we have to use MKS units. Unless you use the mass of an electron in, in electron volts, there is such a number, 511,000. Uh, but uh, we'll use MKS units, SI units. And you get an answer. You know, so that comes out to 9.28 times the mass of joules, which you quickly immediately convert into electron volts. And now we have uh, energy levels, 0.058 n squared, where n is any integer from 1 to infinity. Those are all the energies that an electron can have in that situation. Energies associated with the bounding of the electron between uh, 0 and 5 nanometers. n is 1, n is 2, n is 3, n is 4, and so on. Those are the energies. That's an application of the particle in a box problem to a real situation that we're going to come back to later when we do extremely uh, thin silicon on insulator, um, which I have another uh, topic that will be used when we do that uh, too, and that's tunneling. Tunneling is a quantum mechanical phenomenon that occurs because an electron is a wave. If you have a region where the potential energy is so high that the electron cannot get through it, you would think it bounces off, like a tennis ball hitting a brick wall. But it doesn't quite do that. It's a wave. It reflects off of the wall here, the way you'd expect a wave to reflect. But some of it can go in because it's a wave. We have to model the wave behavior of the electron. So what is a classically forbidden region? There are a lot of physical situations that can create potential barriers. This could be, to the left, this could be all like a metal. To the right, we could have metal, but maybe here we have some uh, semiconductor. And it's more difficult for the electron to penetrate if the semiconductor is doped. That would be one way to arrange this. 
We're about to look at another very physically realizable uh, way by going back to the shot key barrier. But for now, let's just look at this as a conceptual problem here. So potential energy is graphed vertically, and so this green curve is the local potential energy at any given point, and between 0 and t, it has a, a value that's we're going to call it q v sub h, v sub h for just the height of the potential barrier. And I'm using standard notation there. And outside of 0 to t, it's zero. There is no potential energy. So along comes an electron. It gets to this point. It's called classically forbidden because the potential energy is higher than the electron's energy. So the height that I drew this wave represents the energy of the electron. Because you know this vertical axis is an energy unit, so I'll take advantage of that and say whatever height this this wave is at is the energy of the electrons. I'd say, okay, the electron has so many electron volts of energy. You know, that's all kinetic energy. It's propagating freely. I read that number of electron volts off on the vertical axis here, and that's where I draw that squiggly arrow to depict the electron. If the electron comes along with less kinetic energy than the height of this potential barrier, it should bounce off like a tennis ball hitting a brick wall. But we're going to look at what really happens on account of it being a wave. So, so we have a wave representation of the electron. That wave representation will result in some of the probability amplitude for that electron propagating through. And that's where we start to really have to deal with the, the wave particle duality. An electron has a body and it has a soul. It, ha it, has, it has a physical uh, manifestation and it has a probability amplitude, which describes the probability that the electron is at a particular location. Do a little demonstration <laughs> of what the electron might do. So when the electron arrives at the barrier, some of that amplitude reflects back. I didn't depict that. Some of the amplitude enters the forbidden region and attenuates as it passes through and then when it emerges out the other side it's smaller. The height of the sine wave that I'm using to depict the electron represents the amplitude of the wave function of the electron. So it represents the probability that the electron is there where I'm pointing. Um, so it's less probable there than it was over there. Okay well understandable it had a little a barrier to go through. Well we're going to want to write out the, the wave function and so we're going to do that for the purpose of coming to a conclusion about an expression for the probability that the electron passes through the barrier as opposed to reflects off. And of course, in reality, does the electron pass through the barrier or does it reflect off of it? The answer is yes, because it's a wave. Some of the wave goes through, some of the wave reflects back. And all you have in the end is a probability that's on the right side of the barrier and a probability that's on the left side of the barrier. There's the Schrodinger equation. You may recognize that. H is Planck's constant. M star is the effective mass of the electron. We could write this whole thing out in SI units if we want to, and then M is in kilograms. V is the potential energy, and it's a function of X. So I maybe I should write of X on that V, but it's you know between 0 and T, there, there's a value. Q times V is the potential energy. U equals QV. We can solve the Schrodinger equation. In this system, it's fairly straightforward because the thing that you use for potential energy is just a number, and it's only got value in a certain range. So let's look at outside the barrier region. Because outside the barrier region, V equals 0. And so the Schrodinger equation simplifies to this. All right, so I'll go back and you, hopefully you wrote down the Schrodinger equation. Now let V equal 0. It just turns into that. Right? All of this stuff here that's in front of the psi, we're just going to call k squared. Uh, the reason for square is, is a matter of convenience for what the solution is going to look like. So there's a lot of hindsight in deciding that should be a square on there. Um, but we're just right now, right now it's k squared. So the second derivative of the wave function is minus k squared times psi, where k is just some constant. k physically, k is the wave number. It is, it is. There's 2 pi over the wavelength. That's what it turns out to be. So that's what the Schrodinger equation looks like. You can write a solution to that one, right? What function equals minus its own second derivative? You know, it's oscillating, right? So 
we, we have to write a little differently for whether we're to the left of the barrier or to the right of the barrier. If we're to the left in negative territory, I'll write it, I'll call it psi sub 1. We're going to use complex notation, but you can break that down with Euler's theorem and uh, actual sines and cosines. So if a forward propagating wave looks like e to the j, j is squared minus 1, e to the j, k, x. And a reverse propagating wave is e to the minus j, k, x. The electrons coming along from the left, to the, going heading to the right, does the wave function have both of these components? Well, it has a for sure a forward propagating wave to it, but there's nothing backwards propagating about the incoming electron, right? It's propagating to the right. And so you might say, well, B is zero. But then you'd be mistaken because of what happens when the electron hits this barrier at x equals zero. There's a reflection. Just like light hitting a piece of glass, there's a reflection. Some is reflected, some is transmitted. There's always a reflection of that wave. And so there is wave amplitude going back in the negative direction. So we actually need to keep both of these terms. That's not going to be the case when x is greater than t, because there is nothing coming at us from far out. You know, to, there's nothing heading to the left in the negative direction from far out. I'll just write the, the solution of the Schrodinger equation for x greater than t as one single exponential propagating in the positive x direction. So I'll write e to the jkx. Uh, we'll just put a zero in front of e to the minus jkx. What would have been d, <laughs> we'll just say a zero. Nothing is coming from positive infinity. So that's what the solution to the Schrodinger equation looks like outside the barrier. What about inside the barrier? Now inside, we have an energy E, which is less than the barrier potential height, which I have named for historical reasons, Q times V sub H. So V is a voltage. It's going to be the voltage of our device eventually, but Q times V is potential energy. The energy of the electron coming along is less than that. And so when it gets inside the barrier, there is negative kinetic energy because the total energy of the electron is less than the potential energy. Well, total energy is potential energy plus kinetic energy. How do you take a large potential energy, add something to it, and get a smaller total energy? That something must be negative. The kinetic energy is negative, which is why it's called classically forbidden. Because in this region, the kinetic energy is negative. It makes no sense. Well, let's write the Schrodinger equation in this region and go back and look at the Schrodinger equation and ask yourself, is this a, a valid rearrangement when U, the potential energy, equals QVH? Just make sure. Uh, so pause the video and just make sure that you agree with this, this equation. And now we'll call what's in these parentheses beta squared, where again the squared is is done with some hindsight. Uh, it just works better. So we'll write the Schrodinger equation as that, that you know, and you know how to solve that. What function equals its own second derivative? An exponential. Between 0 and t, we'll write this uh, the other way function is psi sub 2. It's in the middle region, so I, I save 2 for this. Is e to the beta x, something that's growing as you go towards greater x, and e to the minus beta x, something that decays as you go towards greater x. Now here too, you might stop and ask, do we need both of these terms? Do they both happen? So you have this large amplitude electron coming along, and it gets in the classically forbidden region, and it turns into an evanescent wave. It turns into a decaying, exponentially decaying wave. So that would be the G. So shouldn't we throw away F? That's a good question, I think. But you see, when this wave that is decaying arrives at the next interface, there's a reflection. And that reflection goes backwards. And that reflection is f, e to the beta x. So you have to keep it. And uh, we'll keep both of them. So now you have three wave functions, psi 1, psi 2, and psi 3, in three different regions, bounded by x equals 0 and t. We can apply boundary conditions to these three wave functions in order to figure things out. What are the boundary conditions? What are the situations that have to be met at x equals 0 and x equals t? And one of them is that the, the wave function has to be the same as it, you go across a boundary. There are no discontinuous changes in the value of the wave function. And we require the wave function be differentiable as you go across the boundary. So that's where we get our boundary conditions, by applying those two conditions. So first you have uh, four equations here. The top two are continuity, that is, 
making the statement that the wave function at x equals 0 is the same to the left as it is to the right, and at x equals t is the same as to the left as it is to the right. And then the next two equations are differentiability, just saying the derivative of the wave function at x equals 0 is the same to the left as it is to the right, and so on. So you can actually evaluate those, right? You can take those wave functions that we just came up with, psi 1, psi 2, and psi 3, actually plug in 0 or big T for x and get some nice little equations, four of them to be exact, which you can solve for those amplitudes a, b, c, f, and g. We already decided d is 0. So you have those five unknowns, a, b, c, f, and g. By evaluating these four equations, you get four equations, five unknowns, but there's a lot you can figure out because it turns out that coefficients themselves aren't so important. What's important is ratios of these coefficients. We're going to look for the probability that the electron gets all the way through the barrier. And that's c squared divided by a squared. Okay. c is the coefficient for the wave function on the right side of the barrier, on the far end. Yeah. So the probability p that the electron goes all the way through is c squared over a squared. You, you have to see this. So, so you go back and look at those wave functions. We're just going to do that. If I want the probability that the electron is on the right side versus the probability that it's on the left side. So what is the probability that the wave made it all the way through? The initial amplitude is a probability that there's a wave that the electron is going to the right and the left side is 100%. It's incoming. And so c squared divided by a squared is the fraction, the probability that, that the electron later is found on the uh, right side of the barrier. We don't have to worry about d. That's nice. So let's find c squared divided by a squared. And I'm not going to, but you can, you can do all this algebra. <laughs> I should say, you can do all this algebra and find that that probability is, well, just some constants, times e to the minus 2 beta t, where we talked about what beta is already. It's the decay constant inside the barrier. We wrote down an expression for beta, so you can put it in here. And we have this expression with the probability. And we're going to use this. Okay, this is important. So this is the probability that an electron tunnels through the barrier right there, in terms of the thickness of the barrier, the effective mass of the electron, the height of the barrier, that is, QV is how many electron volts of this wall of energy do you have to overcome. E is the energy of the incoming electron. H is Planck's constant. We're going to use that next to talk about contact resistance. That will be our first application. That's a very important concept for the metal oxide semiconductor capacitor, or the MOS capacitor. But I'll stop with that. We'll pick up uh, next time with contact potential.